you know, this past Sunday was Palm Sunday, uh, this, the starting of Passover week. And, you know, and, and, and as I was thinking about Passover, and so I'm just going to, we're just going to go ahead and just dive right in because that's just kind of the space I'm in right now, just thinking about the love of God and, and what this week, no, I'm not supposed to get emotional this quick. What this, what this week truly, truly represents. As I was praying during, during worship, I was just saying, Lord, where do you want to go? What's the direction? What are the things that, that we need to, to focus on? And man, I just heard the Spirit of God say, I just want my people to know how much I love them. That the cross truly does demonstrate his unwavering love for us. If we were to look at Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, I believe it is. Can we pull that up on the screen? Um, as I was thinking about Passover week, and we know that and it, it, the Passover that was instituted when Israel was set free from the slavery into Egypt and how God judged the gods of Egypt. That was an awesome message, awesome thought, awesome word from the Lord this past Sunday. How as a result that, that Jesus judged the God of this world. He was judged at the cross. Man, it's powerful. But look at this. It says that, but God demonstrates his own love. Love is demonstrated. Love isn't just what is said. Love isn't just talk. Love is actually shown in its demonstration, in its actions, right? So God wasn't just saying that I love you. God was demonstrating it to, to his children, to his people, to the ones that were, that were in captivity. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, what does that mean? I mean, we were all born unrighteous. So I'm just going to, I'm just going to share for a few moments. Is, uh, is Bianca still here? Bianca, you going to be here to, uh, for the whole service or for most of the service? Okay. All right. Um, uh, uh, during worship, um, the Lord put you on my heart to that when it comes to, um, just sharing about the love of God and the passion that you have and, and what the Lord means to you as father, um, to share that, to share some things just from your heart tonight. Okay. So I thought I'd give you a heads up surprise. Um, what, what is this? Activate Wednesday. This is what we do together, right? Uh, Sushil, where are you? Sushil, there, oh, there you are. Oh, you're close. <laughs> I'm looking for you back there somewhere. That's awesome, man. Um, you'll have a word for tonight. God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners. What does that mean for us to be still sinners? We were all born enslaved to sin we were born into the kingdom of darkness. We were born under Satan's control. And, and so that our nationality, if you want to call it, was sinner. That was our designation. That's what we were marked as. And as a result of the sin nature, we, you know, we rebelled against God in some place. And sometimes we hated God. Uh, for, for a lot of people, we ran from God, Right? And, and so in that moment, because here's my question to you for a moment, the person at work that doesn't like you, is that the person that you're really willing to go to bat for? The person that has stabbed you in the back, that has tried to get you in trouble, that has done everything that they could 
to keep you from being like it's just like they're the thorn in your side whether it's a boss whether it's a fellow employee whether it's just somebody that doesn't like you is that the person that when you get up in the morning you look forward to actually trying to help them succeed even more <laughs> not in the natural some might say Wendy not at all not even in the supernatural think about that so you're surrounded by people who have attacked you who have hurt you and yet um, God dealt with millions and billions and people like that 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 was their response to him but yet his love wasn't dependent on our response to him this is huge his love wasn't dependent on on what we said to him wasn't dependent on how we felt with to him in other words his love was just so pure and so unconditional that it's still even in our fallen state even in our slave state even in our unrighteous state he says I'm going to redeem them I'm going to provide a remedy for them and it, he demonstrated his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I had this picture, just this thought during worship. What must it have been like every year when they offer the sacrifices? Every year when the multiple sacrifices or at the Day of Atonement when the, the bull sacrifice was being offered for the sins. And every, day, every year God's observing that and seeing that every year every year and the thought that the the day is going to come when that's going to be me that would be my son every year that reminder and the looking forward to that point look at verse 9 much more than much more than you know uh, side note that phrase much more is in Romans chapter 5 five times and 5 is the number of grace much more than having now been justified by his blood we shall be saved from wrath we'll be saved from judgment through him through Christ verse 10 for if when we were enemies we were the enemies of God we were reconciled to God through the death of his son much more having been reconciled we shall be saved by his life verse 11 and not only that but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have now received the reconciliation so now uh, we can go to John three sixteen, which all of us knows but let's just what we're doing is we, we're gonna we're just taking a serious dive into the love of God for just a moment because that's what this week represents who he is in John chapter 3 verse 16 we could probably all quote it for God so loved the world right but I'll wait till they pull it up so that we can see it for God sort of loved the world God thought about loving the world for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life yes we just lost that speaker and now it's back God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life look at the next verse for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved now here's the question saved from what saved from what saved from sin saved from darkness saved from addiction saved from uh, disease saved from fear saved from depression saved from I don't know name something else guys saved from what saved, saved from wrath saved from what else poverty saved from what else 
Tornadoes, yes. Yes, saved from tornadoes. What else? Hold it. What? Woke culture. Woke, woke cul culture. Yes, that would be what Patrick talks about right now. No. <laughs> saved from, uh, really saved from the, 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 um, the foolishness of the world is really what we're talking about there, right? What else? Say it. Anxiety? Absolutely. Fear, yes. Generational curses. Ourselves. Oh, that's a good one. This is huge. That the world through him might be saved. Bianca, come on up. And just, just share as the Lord uh, moves on you. And I know you got, man, this is going to be awesome. <laughs> no pressure. No pressure, right? Okay. Um, wow. Mark said, I'm, I can't get emotional. I'm not, I can't believe I'm getting emotional this early. I'm the same way right now. Um, you know, there's something that happens to our soul, our mind, will, emotions, but also our body, when we know that we belong. You walk with a confidence, and your whole being is just like changed, just like joy and peace, and you're like, man, I belong, you know? I'm not fatherless, I belong. And that's what God's saying tonight, hey, you belong. Like, I'm, you're mine. And then he reminded me of this picture, um, this was actually last Wednesday, but he just, uh, when I think uh, Pastor Mark shared that uh, before the foundation of the world or, or something about him going before us and setting the path and everything, and I got the picture of when I was pregnant with my son Isaiah, which is, this is baby number two, y'all. We're excited. God is awesome. Um, and he reminded me of the picture of when I was uh, pregnant with Isaiah, how Jacob and I purposed him in our lives we wanted this child and finally he came and I was preparing my body and and you know making sure that I that I uh, got hydrated and that I ate good and that I rested and that I did everything I needed to do to protect my son before he was born and God was saying that's like you that's like you being in me, like the, like God being the mom that, that where all of us, he has thought about us before the foundation of the world. And he's like, hey, I purposed. You're, I have a purpose for you. I wanted you. And that's why you're alive. You belong to me. So he reminded me of that. And um, he reminded me of the moment when all of uh, that excitement just came. Uh, it got even a hundred times better when my son was born and they put my son right here on my chest and I got to see his eyes for the first time in that connection oh man I was like father thank you and I just felt the love of God overwhelm me and just touch me again and I'm just like father I thank you that in every stage of my life your love the, the revelation of your love continues to grow in me it's just in every stage that you are in, in every stage that we are in, it's like first time, okay, I get married, and then I see a portion of your love, and then you show me how, how, um, my, how I am one with the Father, just like I am one with my spouse. And then when I have my children, how, how uh, his love for me is so much bigger, because then I see how he sees me as he's my father. Now I see how he sees me, and now I'm being, being a mother. I see how I see my son. And I'm just like, Father, your love just keeps growing. That revelation of your love, it keeps growing and growing, and it will continue to grow in every single stage of our lives. So um, I think that's all I'm supposed to share, that, you know, guys, we, we belong. We are not fatherless. Man, we belong to the creator of the universe, and to him be all the glory, and uh, praise you, Jesus. Thank you. That is... That is awesome. We are not fatherless. You know, the need in the world today is, it, it really is, people crave acceptance. People crave, they want 
they want to know that they belong. Why do we have all of these different divisions and people groups and the way that people identify, you know, whether it's, you know, uh, I, I'm part of, you know, this nationality or I'm a, I'm a man, I'm a woman, I'm white, I'm black, I'm this, I'm that, or whatever it is, because people are looking for their tribe. They're looking for what they belong to, but really what they're doing is that craving, it's that inward desire, that inward place of I'm accepted. I am truly, truly loved because once you know how loved you really are, then all of a sudden there is a confidence, there is rest, there is complete, there is your emotions aren't all over the map because now your identity isn't tied to what other people think. Your identity is now tied to what your father thinks and what and how he sees you. Look at Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. I'm just going to go through a couple of other things um, here tonight, and then we'll, we'll see, um, see where things go. Thank you, Lord. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Looking, and this is kind of our outlook on life, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. He's the source of our faith. He's the one who brings it to full completion. And then it says this, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. And I just love that. So there was a joy that he saw that he wasn't in the moment of enduring the cross or, dis or, or dealing with the shame. None of that mattered because he saw you. He saw you, he saw you, he saw you, he saw you. You were his joy. That there would be this moment where you would come into the family of God, that you would make that decision. And all of this and all of, all of, all of those that have, are now part of the family of God was well worth it for now what is happening and what we celebrate this week. He went to the cross. He endured all of that to have the joy of fellowship, to have the joy. Think about this. He was an only son. He was an only child. The cross caused him to have now brothers and sisters and a whole family. The joy that was set before him. Let's look at uh, two more scriptures. Let's start out in Ephesians chapter one. I want to piggyback on something that Bianca was saying real quick. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1. Thank you, Father. Lord, we magnify you. We thank you for insight, revelation. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. That all of creation responds to its creator in the name of Jesus. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus. Look at this. It says in verse 2, it says, uh, grace to you and peace. Grace to you. I mean, this isn't just a, an opening moment. This is, this is, a, uh, this is truth. This is who it is. This isn't just a dear so-and-so. This is grace comes to you. Grace, the, the free gift of God, the goodness of God, the favor of God. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's go on to the next verse. And it says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us. Here's the thing you have to kind of renew your mind to that word has is a past tense word 
Yeah, I feel I hear that, Lord. Who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ? Sometimes people ask the question, why have I not received my manifestation? Why have I not seen the blessing of God? Why have I not seen the promises of God? And and, and I have to tell you that one of the areas that Jennifer and I had to shift in our thinking and in our life is we had to really embrace and grab with our heart, with the the whole of our being, this truth, that I'm not trying to obtain a blessing and I'm not trying to get something that the fact of the matter is I've already been given everything, that he has already blessed us. And so that, so, so, so to do that, you have to ask the question, then what does that look like? If the truth is that I'm already blessed, that I'm already saved, that I'm already delivered, that I'm already healed, then what does that look like? What does that look like for you? Because if I, because I'm going to live out of like, however you respond today, however you respond to people, however you respond to situations in a moment, that's actually what you probably really believe. Thank you for all those amens. The way that you react, if you react like, well, I don't have, I don't have this yet, or you react like, man, when am I going to, what it's just doing is it's just showing you that's what you really believe, that you really haven't so been persuaded by the truth that you've already been blessed with everything that you need. See, my starting point is I'm already blessed and I want to live out of that mindset all the time. I'm not waiting for God to bless me. It's in that place that it really brings into full manifestation the promises of God, the things that he's blessed you with. That's what faith does. He's blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ, verse 4, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Man, so much. He chose us. Let's go back. He chose us in him. That means you were chosen before you ever chose him. He chose all of us. He said, I pick you. That's pretty good, right? The creator of the universe picked you before the foundation of the world, and this is what he chose you to be, holy and without blame before him in love. And so what he did, verse 5, let's go on to that now. He's, he's given you a destiny. He's predestined us to be adopted. We're no longer uh, um, orphans. We're no longer fatherless, but to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. Finally, let's go to Romans chapter 8. And then we'll we'll go through some things here. Romans chapter 8. And I want to go down to... Hmm. Let's, let's, let's go down to verse 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Wow. If God is for us, who can be against us? Verse 32 is, is one of these scriptures that we probably should talk about more often than we do. But it's so over the top that it's hard for us to to comprehend. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. Again, God demonstrating his love, right? How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? man that's awesome if God is willing to give up his own son for our behalf 
do you not think he'll also give you everything else that he's already made every other provision and so as a result it says this remember what I taught Sunday morning if you were here about every accusation every sin every every mistake every uh, disobedience that you've ever committed against God all of that has been wiped away nailed to the cross Colossians chapter 2 tells us it was nailed to the cross and so as a result Satan can't accuse you anymore you have to go back to Sunday and, and listen to that but it says in verse 33 now who shall bring a charge against God's elect who's going to bring a charge against them who can bring an accusation it is God who justifies nobody else has the right to be your 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 judge nobody else has to, has the has the right to be your accuser nobody else has to be, has the right to be your jury your executioner nobody else does they may have an opinion they may think they know you they may do whatever they say and they want to but you know at the end of the day you have been marked clean marked righteous marked uh, holy and blameless in the sight of God and so I don't care what anybody else says about me I don't care what anybody else says to me the only the only voice that I give value in my life that their opinion matters more than any others and that is what God has said about me the reason why sometimes people deal with anxiety or they deal with what people think is because they really, what, they've, what, what you've done is you've, you've allowed or you value their opinion. That's so important to you, what other people think about you, that you value other people's opinions more than you do God's. You've never truly accepted what God has said about you. <clears throat> Christians walk around feeling unworthy all the time and the reason you feel unworthy is because you've never accepted the truth that God has made you worthy because when you accept the truth that he's the one that qualified you that Jesus by what he did on the cross was to forever move, remove your sin to remove the, the nature of sin on the inside of you and to declare eternally that you've now been made righteous that you have now been made innocent <clears throat> then you can't live your life be, from um, how do I say this father um, then living your life drawing your identity from your failures from your mistakes am I in this re am I in this area for a reason Scylla <clears throat> so so we'll just stay right here um because it's easy, isn't it, Scylla, to, um, to feel day after day after day that you're still not measuring up to the standard that you want to live your life from, right? It's easy to focus on where you've fallen short and fallen and, and failed you know or just not been the mom you want to be or not just you know having been the employee you want to be or whatever that is um and so and so what's the, what the devil would like to do is for you to focus on those things right um and i'm just using her as an example the spirit of god is certainly talking here but he's talking to the rest of us at the same time but to do that means you haven't truly agreed with what God has said about you because what God has called you is a success what, what does the scripture just say who can bring a charge against God's elect who can bring, bring an accusation against you 
because God doesn't measure your life. God's acceptance and God's love for you isn't measured in how well you succeed in a given day, right? God's love isn't, um, it doesn't depend on whether you hit a standard or not. Actually, you hit the standard as soon as you accept Jesus Christ. He raised you to that standard in the spirit realm. Now, the question is, is do we now respond in our lives to that truth so that even when I make a mistake or even when I fall short, that that doesn't define who I am, that it's like, you know what? I'm still made righteous. I am still blameless. I am still pure because of what God has said about me, and that's who I am. And so we embrace that truth, and we embrace that identity so much that what happens is the embracing of that, it, it lifts our experience into what God has called us to be. <clears throat> right? So who can bring a charge? It is God who has justified. Scylla, did God justify you through the blood of Jesus? Right? You're justified, right? You're righteous, right? And righteous. So therefore, you haven't fallen short, right? Well, oh, she goes, oh, all have fallen short. Well, we've all fallen short, ha. Huh? There is none righteous, ha. Huh? No, not one, ha. Huh? You've been wanting it, Cedric. There it is right there. I just needed Cedric on the organ a little bit. What's he talking about? <clears throat> before you are born again. There's not a single person that was born into this world already righteous. There's only two people in the history of mankind that has ever been born righteous. One was created righteous, that was the first Adam, and the second one was born righteous, and that was last Adam, and his name is Jesus. Nobody else has ever been come into this world, and that's why we have to be born again righteous. But once you're born again righteous, you're marked that way forever. Well, so, so therefore, I can't think of myself as the person who falls short. I have to start accepting the identity. I am a child of God, man. That's just who I am. Praise God. Otherwise, I'll, I'll magnify failure over faith. I'll magnify what, my, what, what I perceive is, is the life that I'm living in the flesh instead of focusing on the life that he's created for me and what he's defined for me in the spirit. Which is, which is more real to you, this life in the flesh or what God has said about you? Okay, let me finish this up real quick. Um, who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? Who can condemn you now? Because it is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen. Who is even at the right hand of God who also makes intercession for us. In other words, nobody is on Christ's level. So nobody, like nobody supersedes Christ. Like their voice, whether it's the devil's or anybody else, doesn't supersede what Christ has said. And since Christ is the one, the creator is the one who died. And since he's the one that's risen, and since he's the one that's at the right hand of God, and since he's the one that is now interceding on our behalf, you telling me there's somebody more powerful than that? This is what happened at the cross. This is why Jesus, this was the joy that was set before him. So who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Not, not so I've heard songs that talks about nothing can separate me from Christ. This is says who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, 
distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, or peril, or sword. As it is written, for that your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all of all of these things, man, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. So we're more than conquerors through him, what? Who loved us. Now, if that is your mindset, if that's your identi identity, if you realize that what Christ did was completely defeat the devil at the cross, man, that makes me more than a conqueror because he loved me. Then you can move on to verse 38. I am persuaded. Are you, so th that's the next question. Are you truly persuaded? Now, only you can answer that question. Persuaded doesn't mean I come into church and I say, yes, preacher, that's good. I love that. I agree with that. Persuaded is how you live your life and how you think about yourself and how you see yourself in your relationship with God. You know, some people say, yes, I know God loves me, but then, but you feel like he's still distant or you feel like, you know, that you've disappointed him and, and that sort of thing. And so you feel like there's a disconnect between you and God, that what you've done has separated you in some way from God. No, no, no. You got to move to the place of persuasion. Can I tell you, I think I hope it comes across week after week that Jennifer and I, nine and a half years ago, because of what God did in our lives, we are persuaded. We know the goodness of God. We have experienced the goodness of God. We know that he has our best plan for us, that he has our life worked out for us, that everywhere we go, provision is already made, man. We know that. We are fully, fully persuaded. I am so confident. Like when I first started pastoring, if you had told me, hey, I, th I think I want to go try this or I want to do this, I would be the kind of guy that's like, well, I would just make sure you've heard from God on that. Like I didn't want to be the guy to counsel you to take a step of faith in case you fell flat on your face. Because now what are you going to say about me? But now I'm like, yes, go for it. You got to get out there. That's where you're going to experience God. That's where you're going to experience his best. I mean, you know, like I'm encouraging people. I'm thinking Derek Crosby, man. I was like, I was telling him, yeah, go start your own business, man. Let's get out there. Go for it. Like out there is where you're going to discover even more the faithfulness of God. Because I know God loves to be involved in people's lives. Just get out there and do stuff. Get out there and trust him. The love of God. I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, like no devil, no demon, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come. This is Paul. This is how persuaded he was. Nor height nor death, nothing as tall as it is, nothing as far below the earth as you could go, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Whew. Praise God. Thank you, Father. Alan, can I get you on the keys for a moment, please, sir? How persuaded are you that you are so loved by God? You should let this week, as you celebrate Friday, Good Friday, the death of Jesus, what does the cross represent? It represents not only his death, it represents your death. It does. As we celebrate Sunday, all of this is wrapped up in the love of God. How loved are you? How loved are you? Thank you, Father. Father, I'm persuaded. We are persuaded. Father, help us be more persuaded. More persuaded to truth. More persuaded to your love. More persuaded that you intentionally before the foundation of the world had made the decision 
to redeem us, to deliver us, to save us, that you chose us to be in you, that you chose us, chose us to be without blame. That year after year, as you might have seen those sacrifices, knowing that your day would come, that no longer would it be the blood of bulls or goats or animals to try to take care of and cover our sin, but that it would be the pure blood of the precious Son of God that would truly purge us, that would truly cleanse us from evil, an evil conscience, a sin consciousness. That by being, by, by, by saying yes to you and, and by responding to you, that we could be filled now with your spirit, live life with you, 